The Great Trouble, A Mystery of London, the Blue Death, and a Boy Called Eel by Deborah Hopkinson. Chapter 11, Bernie. Saturday, September 2nd. Where is he? I came awake instantly. Vaguely, I realized that I was stiff, stuffed as I was into the small space between the rows of barrels on the barge, but that didn't matter. What mattered was the voice. I knew that voice. Don't annoy it, Jake. That weasley little urchin ain't dead, Fish Eye Bill Tyler was saying. My guess is he's been out here mudlarking, and that means you've seen him. Now, Bill, I can't say yes and I can't say no, Jake answered. All these boys look about the same to me. Don't give me that. You know, eel, the scrawny one with eyes like a tower raven, growled Fisheye. This is a serious business, Jake. That boy's got something that belongs to me, something I have a right to. I have a right to him, too, if it comes to it. I don't know nothing about it, squeaked Jake. I didn't dare lift up my head, but I could almost see Fisheye squeezing his arm. Don't expect me to believe that, Fisheye Bill scoffed. I could imagine his cold glare. Men like Jake didn't fare well under Fisheye's gaze. He went on. Now, my friend, are you going to tell me where he's at, or do I have to break off your other thumb? Like I told you before, Bill, I ain't seen Eel for months, came Jake's complaining whine. I thought the lad was dead. So Jake hadn't been the one to rat on me, at least not yet. Besides, ain't Eel a big lad now? Too old for what you want him for, Jake went on. That lad's too growed up to slip through windows like a little snakesman so you can break into houses. Never mind that, I heard Fish I Bill say. That's my business. Well, Bill, I got business to attend to myself, so leave me to it, won't you? Jake said. Turn your nose up at me if you will, but at least a scavenger's life is honest. I grinned. Jake was holding his own with Fish I Bill. His voice faded, and I figured he must be wading through the sludgy water toward Tower Bridge. I crouched lower in my hiding place, fighting the urge to poke my head up and lay my eyes on Fisheye Bill, Tyler, just to prove this wasn't a nightmare. Come on, Jake, what say you and me take a break from the stinking place and head over to a pub? Fisheye said. You can rest your legs. I'll even buy you some breakfast and a beer to go with it. There was a pause. Or maybe a gin, if you'd rather. I froze. Jake might not have said anything about me before now. But if Fisheye lured him to his side with the promise of gin, who knew what might happen? Jake could end up telling him how he'd gotten me a nice situation at the Lion Brewery over on Broad Street. I strained my ears to catch Jake's answer. I might not be at the line anymore, but I didn't want Fisheye poking around anywhere near Broad Street. I could only hope that if Jake did talk, that yellow flag warning of the cholera would keep Fisheye Bill away. Another time, Bill, another time came Jake's voice at last. I let my breath out. I was still safe. When I got back to Broad Street that morning, the first person I saw was Reverend Whitehead. He looked as if he hadn't slept. Are things worse, sir? I said. I'm afraid so, he said, wiping his brow with a handkerchief. I spent most of the night visiting families, yet there isn't much I can do. He rubbed a hand over his eyes, and I could see dark circles under them. It strikes so viciously, so quickly, he went on. Mrs. Griggs herself is near death, and his words sent a jolt through me. That can't be. She was fine yesterday. Reverend White had laid a hand on my shoulder. I'm sorry, Eel. I forgot you didn't know. She became ill last evening. Bernie, too. Bernie? But I could hardly believe what I was hearing. But if Mrs. Griggs is sick, who is helping them? Betsy is too small. She can't. He raised a hand. Calm yourself, lad. Flory Baker is there and as capable a nurse as I've ever seen. Flory, but will she get it by being so close to sick people? I fear everyone may be in danger from the filthy air and ill-ventilated rooms of this neighborhood, he replied. The atmosphere in these crowded streets is unwholesome indeed. Miasma is the cause of this pestilence. Poor Mrs. Griggs, I thought. She had just watched her husband die. She knew what would almost certainly happen to her. Mrs. Griggs was devoted to her children. It would break her heart to be so sick she couldn't care for Bernie. Just then I caught sight of Dr. Rogers about to turn onto Poland Street. He raved at Reverend Whitehead without smiling and shook his head. 
Annie's mum, Mrs. Lewis, had mentioned that he was the doctor her family relied on. Probably many other families, too. One look at his face told me he was powerless to help against this terrible disease. No, Dr. Rogers couldn't help. But what about Dr. Snow? It might be a foolish plan. After all, Dr. Snow treated the queen herself. Would he care about the poor people on the other side of Regent Street? It was worth a try. I'd given up on asking Dr. Snow to help me get my situation back. That was a small thing. Just one mudlark who wanted to keep his job. But this, this was about a whole neighborhood suffering. And it was about Bernie. Fifteen minutes later, I'd snaked my way through the crowds on Regent Street and was banging on Dr. Snow's back door. Mrs. Weatherburn opened it, adjusting her cap and looking at me with a keen, stern expression. Yes, boy, what is it you want now? As you will recollect, I paid you last night. Yes, ma'am, thank you. It's just that I need to see Dr. Snow, please. It's urgent. She arched her eyebrows in surprise. Well, that may be, but I'm afraid Dr. Snow left early to attend a surgeon in Kensington. I felt panic rising inside. But we need him. The people on Broad Street need him. She frowned. For what? He hasn't heard then, I asked. The cholera has hit Broad Street and Berwick Street, Poland Street, and Little Windmill Street, the whole neighborhood near the Golden Square. Mrs. Weatherburn stepped back as if she might catch it just from being near me. I wondered if Dr. Snow would be too frightened to come to Broad Street. Even doctors could get deadly diseases. Maybe he would think the air in our neighborhood was too dangerous. I don't believe he has heard about the outbreak, she said. He's been so busy I've barely seen him myself. I'd like to at least tell him about it. Will he be back soon? Not until after dark. I stared up at her for a minute, then turned and walked away. I kicked a stone on the path, swallowing hard, feeling tears sting my eyes. Mr. Griggs had barely lasted a day. How long could Bernie fight the Blue Death? Have you given the cages a thorough cleaning lately, boy? Mrs. Weatherburn called after me. I've noticed quite a pungent smell the last day or two. It's not enough just to feed them, you know. It's probably time to change all the bedding. Yes, ma'am, I replied. You couldn't put anything over on Mrs. Weatherburn. All I could think of as I cleaned the cages was how much Betsy and Bernie had liked petting the bunnies. I wanted everything to go back to the way it had been two days ago. It ain't fair, I said. It just ain't fair.